All right, well, welcome. I hope, trust uh, everyone in the back can hear me. Fantastic turnout, so thanks for coming, because I intentionally made the talk title and description as vague as possible, hoping to weed out those who are not curious. So thank, thankful for you guys being here, because you're the curious ones. What could I possibly be talking about straws at a JavaScript conference? Kyle Simpson, known as Getify Online. If you're into that whole stalking thing, you can find out whatever you need to know about me uh, using that URL. Just one quick little plug that I'll make is that uh, if you're in the previous talk and you heard Al, uh, Axel talking about the fantastic stuff coming in ECMAScript 6, I loved the talk. It was a great talk. He's a super smart guy. I read all of the blog posts that he writes. But um, I've been writing a set of JavaScript books, and the title of this series of books is called You Don't Know JavaScript. And if you're interested in any sort of counterpoint that essentially argues the complete opposite perspective of just every, almost everything you taught, uh, you might check out those books. So you don't know js.com redirects because I'm writing these for free up on GitHub. But I'll also point out that um, these uh, books, the very first one of these is called Scope and Closures. And I'm doing a book signing today at 6.30 because it just finally got published. Uh, O'Reilly is the publisher. So it's actually in, in a sellable format now that you can buy if you're interested. So you can come by and check out um, that. It took a long, long time. I also have stickers for the series that you can come by because I'm going to be doing office hours directly after this talk in the O'Reilly booth at 2.50 p.m. So that's it for me. I've got a bunch of stuff to get through, and we're going to have this kind of long, winding road in this talk. I have to give you the disclaimer that this is a somewhat unconventional talk. I like to keep this talk sort of under wraps. I don't give it at very many conferences because uh, the ideas that I'm going to present are both very personal and also very controversial. And uh, we're going to go through this weird sort of winding philosophical road for the first half or so of this talk. And I promise it's going to seem a little bit boring, like where's the code, where's the tech? We're going to get there, but you have to understand something about my mindset, something about the process that I've gone through, say, over the last 18 months to 24 months, because this has been a talk that's been in the making, if you will, that the ideas behind this have been in the making for quite a while. So um, where we're going to start is in the drive through and I know everybody loves to take their $100,000 sports cars through the drive through so this guy was awesome. I don't know what he's thinking uh, going to McDonald's. Well, we're going to start with a drive through and I'm going to pose this question, what possibly could a drive through have to teach us about optimizing our tools and our processes? And those seem like those things would be rather unrelated, but um, we're going to meet someone, and I don't actually know this lady's name, but I'm just going to call her Sheila, because she looks like a good Sheila to me. Very nice, friendly, welcoming smile, and she's handing me my big drink as I pull up to the drive through That's not actually uh, me. I, I don't uh, drink that big of a drink, but I... I <laughs> This is Sheila. We'll call her Sheila for the purposes of this talk. And, uh, you know, she has a nice welcoming smile, and, and we can feel good about ourselves for that brief few moments while we're trying, we're engaging in that time-honored tradition of drive throughs where we try to exchange as little money for as many calories as possible in the highest ratio as possible. So she helps us through that process, gives us our drink and our food. But I want to pose this question, what is missing from this picture? And if you know the title of the talk, you probably can guess, but let me help you out. What's missing from this picture is there is a question, and this sounds like a silly question, but I actually asked this question one time in a drive through This is a real true story, and the answer that I got is a rather profound one. So one evening I had been out riding my bike, and I was tired, and I went up to Taco Bell, everybody's favorite restaurant. It was late at night, and I ordered some tacos and a giant drink. And I pull up to the window, and they hand me my drink, and there is no straw with my drink. And I'm exceedingly thirsty, but it's filled to the brim and almost overflowing, and so I don't want to spill it all over myself. And so I just patiently wait, thinking I'll get my food and my straw rather quickly, and that took at least two minutes, which felt like 20 years, waiting for this drink while I was tired and thirsty. And when the lady came back, I guess it was feeling a little bit, uh, you know, cheeky I, I, or maybe sarcastic, but I asked if I could speak with the manager, because I had noticed that this was not the first time that I'd been presented with a drink, but not presented with a straw to drink that drink. And I don't know if any of you have had that experience. You might recall back that they typically hand you the drink, and then they hand you your food at some later point, and with your food in the bag or something like that is when they hand you the straw. And I had noticed that this had happened in a bunch, and it was annoying to me, particularly this evening. So I asked her this question. I asked the manager this question. Uh, what, what is up with that? Why, why would you not give me my straw with my drink? Because I obviously can't really use my drink well without the straw. Now, she gave me an answer that is the foundation of this talk, but I'm going to make you wait a bit before I give you that answer, because she said, oh, no, no, we thought about it very carefully, and there's a very important reason why we do it that way. And it got me to thinking, and it got me to asking lots of questions, but unfortunately, we have to step a little bit further back even than this particular event. We need to take a step back 
to understand some other things that I went through. So we need to go back about 18, uh, a little, maybe 12 months or so ago. I was on a beach in Aruba. Those of you that don't know Aruba, I present you this map so that you can know exactly where Aruba is. It's right off the coast of South America. I was invited to speak at a conference and, you know, they really had to twist my arm to take me and my family to Aruba. But we go to Aruba and we show up and this was quite literally the scene that we saw. It's beautiful. My, my two-year-old son at the time called these the pink mingos because he couldn't say flamingo. And this was this beautiful view. And of course, I didn't get to enjoy that because I was in a conference center at a conference while my family was out enjoying these beautiful views. But it was on this island of Aruba during this week that I spent there that I had a lot of what I consider to be somewhat deep and profound thoughts. I asked a lot of questions of myself. And the, the questions that I asked, and in particular the answers that I arrived at, have really begun to reform the way I look at myself, the way I look at my position in our industry, the way I look at what I have to contribute and what I don't have to contribute. And that is where this this talk sort of started. I didn't have a name or a theme for it until Sheila in the drive-thru. But um, there were some lessons that I learned while I was on Aruba, and I want to briefly talk you through some of those lessons. The first one is that I consider myself to be somewhat of a craftsman at what I do. I don't know if you share the same feelings about your own code, but I take pride in the sorts of code that I write. I take pride in knowing what I'm doing, trying to do it to the best of my ability, trying to teach others to do it to the best of my ability. And so, metaphorically speaking, the way that I look at my own code is I look at my own code kind of like this is the sort of sandcastle that I could build with my son. And in fact, one of these days, we were sitting on the beach and we were making some sandcastles and having lots of fun, or at least I thought we were having some fun. And and in my mind, of course, I'm as an engineer, I'm digging out trenches to like protect us from the coming waves, and I'm planning out the architecture of our, our, our sandcastle. And of course, my son couldn't care less. He was just playing in the sand and knocking things down and picking these up. We'll come back to him in just a moment. But I began to realize, especially when I looked around at other people, I began to realize that my perspective of the sort of sandcastle that I was building doesn't really match up. So in my mind's eye, what I see about my sandcastle and also what I see about the sorts of code that I create, the sorts of ideas that I think that I come up with, is that I'm creating these masterpieces. In reality, my sandcastle is probably a bit more like this. And I'm not just trying to belittle my sandcastle making skills. But in reality, if you were to take a look at all of the code that I've ever written, that I've ever put out into the open, and you were to try to put some sort of value on that to the greater community, even though my ego would like to tell me that all the things that I write are brilliant, and that people just haven't figured out how brilliant they are yet, but they will eventually figure that out, My ego tells me that that's the way I should look at my code, but in reality, I began to realize the first of the important lessons that I really needed a healthy dose of humility. I needed to start by reassessing how I looked at the sorts of things that I had to contribute to the community, because I felt like what I had to contribute to the community was the best code I could possibly write, and I wanted to change the world with the code I write. I wanted people all over to come and gaze at my sandcastle and tell me how amazing my code was. And in reality, my code's a lot more like the sin castle. So the first of those lessons was humility. The second of those lessons is that as soon as I stopped digging those trenches, sure enough, the processes of water would come along, and they began to wash away all of my not-so-master work. And I began to realize a second um, sort of lesson from this over this process of being on the beach. And that second lesson that I learned is that things are really temporary. Not everybody is a Jeremy Ashkenaz that writes a coffee script and changes the face of what we know about JavaScript programming. Not everybody is somebody that invents something that tens of millions of people are using on a daily basis. And while I would like to think that I've come up with something that important and that interesting, the reality is that's not true. You can look at the stars on my GitHub repos to know that. You can know that I don't have conferences named after me or anything that I've ever done. To know that in reality, the things that I'm doing now while they'll still exist, they will be digitally archived somewhere in the annals of GitHub forever and a day, we know that they will still exist, but nobody's going to care about anything that I've done three, five, ten years from now. In fact, nobody cares about the stuff I wrote two years ago. It's an incredibly temporary industry because there are always amazing, talented, brilliant people like the people in this room that are writing incredible, amazing code every single day, and it comes and it washes away all the things that have been done before. And so while I'd like to think that I want to make some sort of permanent mark upon our industry, in reality I need a healthy dose that things are temporary. Okay, 
So that was the second of my lessons I needed to learn. The third of my lessons wasn't actually on the beach. It was at another part of this resort that we were staying at. Every morning we would go out to this little alcove, and there was an opening maybe 10 or 15 feet wide, not very big at all, and there was some water there, and we were told by the hotel staff that if you take out some pieces of bread, your son can throw them out and feed the fish, and they'll come swarming up. And we thought, yeah, okay, so we'll see, like, uh, you know, a couple of fish. And this isn't actually a picture of what we saw because I have a crappy Android phone and I couldn't capture the moment properly. But I did have an amazing experience like this. Every single time we went out there, we would throw the first piece of bread out and I would see this amazing swarm of fish in lots of extra colors that you don't even see here. So I just ganked something off of Google Images to give you a picture of what we were experiencing in real life. And we would see in this 10 or 15 foot span Literally hundreds, probably thousands of fish just came out of nowhere as soon as bread started to be thrown down. And we asked ourselves, you know, how could they, we can't possibly feed all of them. We, we have an entire loaf of bread and that wouldn't feed all of these fish. But it was all in the moment. It was all in the having fun. And by the way, that lesson that I learned from my son, he was in the moment having fun building a sandcastle. It didn't matter that it was well architected. It didn't matter that it was going to last. It didn't matter that it was going to make a difference. It just mattered that he experienced the moment. And that was what I began to get away from that and from these experiences with feeding these fish. And I began to recognize something kind of interesting because I was sitting on one side, my son and my wife on the other side, and whenever I'd throw out a piece of bread onto my side, there would, of course, be a a swarm of fish, and one fish would probably get the piece of bread. And I would notice that that was not always the biggest or strongest fish. It usually was, but not always. And I began to realize something, that there is what... Whatever you call it, whatever you label it, if you're a religious person, you, re- you label it as divine. If you are non-religious, you might label it as luck or fortune. But there is something of a component, in fact, a big component, of what I'll just call fortune because um, I, I, don't, you know, I can't list all the possible ways that people talk about this. But there was something much bigger than the fish at play, and that just was where I happened to throw a piece of bread. Because if I threw it here, no matter how big or how smart or how intelligent, if the big fish happened to be on this side... He's not going to get to the piece of bread and he's not going to get fed. And so it all depended upon something entirely external to their system, entirely out of their control, and they had to do the best that they could but recognize at the end of the day that there was some component bigger than themselves leading them to it. People that have changed our industry just happen to have the right idea at the right time and have the right conversation. And there was something bigger than themselves that was part of that process. So this was another lesson that I learned that no matter how good or how smart I am, I have to submit myself to the idea that I may never be in that right place and that right time to change the world with those ideas. So, these are the lessons that I was learning in Aruba, and I began to ask myself a variety of questions. You probably heard the phrase, no man is an island, but I began to ask myself, somewhat isolated, you know, I am an island, am I an island? Is it possible that I'm a unique snowflake that's totally different from every other developer? And maybe the things that are important to me are not necessarily important to anybody else. Maybe what's best for me is best only for me. And these questions began to roll around in my head, and they led to some other sorts of questions where I began to observe around me the world's constraints and what those constraints were on me. So I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. These aren't actually things that I took pictures of, but some examples of some places in the world where there are bigger things going on. And these questions that I started to ask about the constraints that are placed upon me uh, from the rest of the world. The first one is, the story of this picture is just, I I don't even know exactly how to explain it, but if you look this up, this is a a handicap accessible, a wheelchair accessible ramp with a giant pole right in the middle of it. And this is somewhere in some bizarre city in Europe. I don't know exactly the history or provenance of this picture. But what I did learn when I did a little bit of research on it is that there were two different jurisdictions. And I know here in the States, we never have any governmental jurisdictions that conflict with each other. But there, apparently, they have government jurisdictions that can't agree with each other. And one was responsible for building the ramp, and one was responsible for moving the light poles. And guess which one happened first? Obviously, the people built the light poles, and then they said, okay, it's your job to go and... uh, They built the ramp, and they said, it's your job to go and move the light poles. And some two years later, those still had not been moved. Again, we don't have government problems like that, but apparently in Europe they do. So uh, we began to ask this question, uh, was it really useful at all for them to build this ramp? Because, you see, what they did was they optimized in a smaller myopic thing that says, I can only handle what my jurisdiction is capable of doing. 
I cannot actually think about or affect the entire system. I can only pay attention to my little part, and my little part is to build a ramp. And this other guy that was responsible for the light poles said, well, I don't have the budget to move the poles, so I can't think about the bigger system. I can't think about the giant middle finger that this gives to anybody that needs to use that ramp because that's a a bigger question that's above my pay grade. And so that's the answer to, to how does this even happen. And this next slide is even better because you ask yourself, how is it, what the... And I don't, know, I don't know the actual story behind it, but I could make something up about plumbers' unions. And there was one guy who was responsible for the plumbing on one wall, and there was another guy who had electrical in the other wall or something like that. But somehow, some way, this resulted from the same sort of basic symptoms that there was a loss of the bigger picture when people were working with things. And that sets us up for where I'm trying to go. So we are, um, I know that you may be wondering, when are we ever going to get to the code? We're right at the halfway part, and we're almost to the halfway part of the slide. So I'm not as far behind as you might think. <clears throat> but we begin to ask this question when you look at it sort of mathematically. I'm not going to teach you about math, but imagine that you could plot a complex system as a series of functions, and we plot this on the graph. And if you've ever taken any sort of computer science or math, you might know that we have this principle that talks about finding the optimum. And there are algorithms for finding the optimum. When we look at the entire system, we can clearly say that A is the maximum. That is the optimum of this mechanism of this system. But when we myopically focus down to a small portion, we end up doing what is called optimizing for a local maximum. And this has become one of my recent rants a lot, if you follow any of the things I talk about on Twitter, because I began to see that there were an awful lot of places in our world not only just in the real world, but especially true in the things that we do in the industry, that end up being able to be explained by somebody optimized for a local maximum. They could not optimize for the entire system because it was too complex and there were too many variables and too many people to make happy. And so they chose arbitrarily one part and they found the maximum there and everybody rubber stamped it and that's how we went about our way. And what I'm really asking is, are we missing the forest for the trees when we do that sort of thing, when we do that sort of thing with our tools and our processes? I don't know how many of you have cars that, you know, because I know cars aren't as maybe popular in this city, but in other places, everybody drives, and I'm in Austin, and we have to drive everywhere because everything's spread out. And if you've ever wondered, maybe I'm the only one that's ever wondered, but why aren't there mute buttons on car radios? And the simple answer, of course, is that, well, why do you need a mute button? Because there's an on-off button. Um, Except we have fantastically more complex radios now these days where they're full entertainment systems with GPS maps and all kinds of other entertainment stuff going on. And if I get a phone call, I just want the audio to go away, but I certainly don't want my GPS directions to go away because I'm going to get lost. And so you begin to ask this question, even in the most complex of cars, you have to really go and look and you probably won't find a mute button. Maybe every once in a while you'll find one. But somebody somewhere someday back in the 50s said, radios don't need mute buttons, and we never really revisited that. And they optimize for a local maximum. This is another example. I stole this directly from a guy named Arl Balkin's talk. He was a fantastic talk. This is the URL, so I highly recommend you go watch this talk. He was talking about holistic design principles. Great talk that I saw at Real Time Conf. But um, he showed this sign. This is from a train in Europe. And he said for the first time in his life, he was having trouble figuring out how to get off of this train. And you can see why. Because what it says is, step one, wait for the door unlock sign to come on. Then lower the window and stick your arm out the window to open the handle, because obviously there's not a handle on the inside. Now, the, the, the brief history of how this came about is that back in the 50s and 60s when this train was first built, they didn't have such a thing as door locks. So the doors just shut, but they were not capable of being locked. And obviously, if there was a handle on the inside, and if it's going at 80, 100 miles an hour, and you accidentally bump up against the handle and it opens the door, that's a terrible thing. So they said, let's just put the handle on the outside so there's less accidents and less people falling out of moving trains. Makes complete sense, right? Except some point later, maybe in the 70s or 80s, somebody came along and said, I've invented door locks, let's put door locks on all our trains. So they went and installed door locks. In fact, they installed these fancy little LCD screens but they never stopped to ask themselves about the bigger su- system at play. They never said, well, now that we've installed door locks, maybe we ought to put a freaking handle on the inside. Because that wasn't that guy's problem. His problem was just to do as he was told to install a lock, and he didn't ask about the bigger question. And again, we optimized for the local maximum. This is this windy talk. But we finally come back to Sheila in the drive-thru. And the question that I ask of Sheila's manager in the drive-thru, 
why is it that you hand me a drink and you do not hand me my straw until you hand me my food later? And her response uh, plays into this same theme because she said, well, we've actually studied this and what we've realized is if we hand you your drink and your straw, then most people will spend up to 10 or 15 seconds fiddling around trying to open up the straw, stuff the straw in their drink and take two or three big gulps of their drink before turning their attention back to the window to receive their food. And usually, when we're in a fast food, we're trying to get it out fast, so we've got your food ready, but we can't hand it to you because you're fiddling around with your straw. And we realized if we just didn't give you your straw, you didn't have anything to fiddle around with. And then if we handed your straw with your food, most people don't, they feel guilty and they won't sit there and hold up the line when they have everything that they need. And so they were thinking about optimizing things, and the truth is, Behind that nice, friendly smile, she's saying, hurry up and drive away. Well, she's not saying it, but the the bosses, the people that have optimized these drive-thrus are saying, GTFO of my drive-thru. Get on with it. We don't need you to sit here. This is not a social hour. I'm not interested in you playing around with your straw. And so that hit me like a ton of bricks because somebody thought deeply about this and made a trade-off. And the trade-off was... Uh, let's get people through quicker, which in the, in the whole picture, that is one of my goals. One of my goals when I go to a drive through is to get out of there as quickly as possible so nobody sees me in the drive through That is definitely one of my goals, but it's not my only goal, and it's probably not my only important goal. In fact, there's a more important goal that I have, and that is that I want to enjoy my drink. And yet we constrained the problem and we optimized that away. So what is the point of all of this philosophical rambling? In our final minutes together, what could I possibly share with you uh, about the point of all this? The point is, and this is where it starts to get a little controversial, I'm going to argue with you that standards are optimizing for a local maximum. And what kind of standards am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about standards like we standardize on a particular tool set on our team because if we all agree that it's gulp versus grunt, then everybody can agree and it just works. And if we all agree on sublime or Adam or whatever, if we all agree that it's exactly this way. And in fact, when you think about the way that the JavaScript language has evolved, they've said we want one JavaScript, this principle that there should only be one version of the language because it's too much chaos if everybody has their own language. And I would suggest to you, while there's lots of good spirit behind those ideas, perhaps we've missed, perhaps we've optimized for the local maximum. So in our final few minutes together, I'm going to try to poke some fun at that. And really what I'm getting at is is that we need less, and I say less in quotes, we need less standards. I don't mean that the standards are bad, but we need to stop focusing so much on standardizing and focus more on creating better tools to solve our job, our job issues, the problems that we have. We have a problem, and so we go looking for a solution, and the most easy solution that we find is, well, our problem is that nobody can agree, so let's just pick one standard and get everybody done. But what that ignores is that every single developer on your team has a different way of thinking about their code. in in the native way their brain thinks. And we say, well, we're going to ignore all of those things and say you just need to change the way that you think to think the way that everybody on the team can agree. And while that does produce some short-term results, I think in the whole, if we were to study this, I think we'd find that lots of developers that find themselves frustrated by having to change too much of the way they think either suffer in silence for a long time being unproductive or they just leave. And that could be an explanation for the churn that we have in our industry. So, if you go and find this slide, you'll see that on one side there's a space and on one side there's a tab. And yes, I'm invoking that old religious debate, spaces versus tabs. I'm not going to tell you what my answer to that debate is or what what I think, but I'm also going to bring up the semicolon versus no semicolon. That's a famous religious debate that we have in the JavaScript world. And I'm going to say to you, what if your team didn't have to agree on those things? What if it was possible to have tools that instead of complaining to you that you've done it wrong, simply fix the problem? They simply fix that you, don't, you haven't written spaces the way the other guy wrote spaces, and it just fixes it. What if that was possible? And I think it is possible. So I've been experimenting with a variety of tool sets to sort of do those things. And this is a concept. This tool hasn't been built, but it's a code-style formatter that controls in two-way transformation. So you define what your personal style is for all of these things, and you define what the team style is, and you use a tool to make the transformations both ways. When you check out, the tool transforms it to your style, and when you check in, it transforms it back. So there's an agreed-upon standard, but what I'm looking at in my editor is what I want it to look like. 
What difference does it make what you want the code to look like? Why do you get to say what it should look like inside of my editor? So I think instead of bitching and complaining and our linters about these things, we could make smarter tools that fix a lot of these problems. And this is not just styles. I love this slide because I tweeted this joke out. This is my vision of how the TC39 committee works. Obviously, it's not true. And I have tremendous respect for them, although I don't always agree, but I have tremendous respect for what they do. I think that's a fantastic group of people, and I wouldn't want the task of trying to figure this stuff out. But when I tweeted this joke out, by the way, one of the core members, Alan Worth Brock, said, well, obviously, I'm the guy in the sharp jacket in the corner. So that's Alan Worth Brock, but this is just a joke because... The question I want to pose is, what's really happening in this committee? And the truth is, they have way too many constituents to possibly come up with a solution that everybody's going to be happy with. So there's lots of watering down, there's lots of trade-offs, and they do the best that they can, and sometimes they hit it out of the park, and sometimes I think it falls quite flat. But that's just the nature, the reality of things, because they are optimizing for far too complex a system. So they just simply pick local maximums to optimize for. And I want to ask this bizarre and controversial question. What if you could customize the JavaScript language itself to your own liking? What if we could create tools that allow you to decide the way you want the language to work instead of being beholden only to one standard? For example, Sweet.js, if you're not familiar with macros, macros are coming to the language. It's been all but declared that this is probably going to happen in the next version in ES7. I just picked one really complex example to show you the sorts of things we can do. We can declare these macros, and I'm not going to teach you how this works, but the bottom line is, if you've ever done a test where you've had to say x and x.y and x.y.z, which sucks, you can declare a macro that fixes that for you, and in this case, they declare the nullity macro. So you declare in-language macros. It's sort of an in-language rewriting of your code that fixes code problems, and they've come up with all kinds of incredible um, solutions. There's tons of stuff out on the site. So Sweet.js was an independent project that's now shepherded by Mozilla, Brendan Eich, as, as far as I understand, has said this is probably what macros are going to look like. We're pretty close to it when they land in the language. So we can start using tools like this right now because they can transform our code. <clears throat> Block scoping, that was mentioned in the previous section. Real briefly, if you weren't, uh, weren't around, we used to declare vars like this inside of our blocks because we wanted it to be block scope, but it didn't behave so. So when we referenced it outside, it worked. Now with the let keyword, we're getting block scoping the way it ought to work. So that's great, except there's some problems with block scoping because there's lots of issues with refactoring. As soon as you start throwing things inside of blocks, now you have to pay a lot more attention to your blocks, and especially because let sort of implicitly hijack the existing blocks that they sit in, that produces more mental tax on your part to think, oh, can I move this if block out or not? And, and I don't know about you, but that's how I develop. I write something, and I wrap it in a for loop, and a try catch, and an if statement, and eventually it just happens to start working. But... It's not, it's not going to make my life any easier if I start using block scoping. So you have to be careful with these sorts of things. Now, there's a better style. There's a more explicit style which declares explicit blocks. Like you see here, this let declaration form that declares an explicit block for my bindings. And that makes it a little bit clearer that this block is specifically for binding. So it makes it just a little bit less mental tax. Unfortunately, this was rejected from the language. They decided not to put that syntax in even though I think that there's a case to be made that that's the superior of the two, they chose not to put that in. So are we just stuck? Do we just have to deal with the problems? And I say no, because I think tools can fix this problem. So I say right now you can start writing code exactly like this, even though it's not standard JavaScript, and you can use a tool like the one I built called Letter, which goes through and finds code like that and transpiles it into something that will work and will behave as block scope. Little known fact, the try-catch clause is block scoped. The catch clause is block scoped, and that's been true since ES3. So you wouldn't write code like this, but you also don't write the code that comes out of the CoffeeScript compiler. This is compiled, generated code, and it works, and it means you could use block scoping today rather than waiting for ES6. And someday, when you don't care about ES3 anymore and you don't want that ugly code, you just start passing let or the ES6 tag, and it declares explicit blocks with your let declarations at the top. Now, if you think this try catch is ugly and hacky, it is. But it's also the official way that the Google Tracer, the tool that's being used by the TC39 committee, it's also the official way that they're doing things. Now, what about parsing non-standard or partial JavaScript? How could I possibly do that? Well, I wrote a tool called Literalizer that goes through and finds your string literals and finds your 
um, reg- regular expression literals, all those hard things that make it hard for you to parse code without thinking about things, literalizer pre-identifies them, so it leaves the rest of the code untouched, lets you do your own parsing and your own transformations on your code, and many of my tools are using it. So what exactly is it that I'm suggesting? Is it anarchy, oligarchy, it, all of the above? I'm suggesting that it's time to start focusing only on what we can standardize on and start focusing more on what we can customize and we can build tools to help us with this task. In other words, I'm suggesting JavaScript have it your way. Or to put it even a little bit more playfully, choose your own JavaScript adventure. Because we don't have to be stuck to just what everybody agrees. Now you should be asking yourself, what kinds of things are you talking about? Well, here's a couple of quick examples. I'm about to run out of time. But a couple of quick examples here. We have things like um, optional ternaries. The ternary else, we can make those optional. I've already tested this out. I have a tool that does this. You can make those optional if they're undefined. So when you write code like that, if you want to just drop the the optional else, you can do that, and a tool can transpile that to code. Another example with bindings. This is a more complex one. I won't explain all the code, but we have this principle called soft binding, which is not quite like hard binding, but it creates a better default for this bindings. So this little soft bind utility is okay, but the code kind of sucks. And what if we could just make that happen exactly the way we want? And I have experimented with this idea of using the little hash symbol as a soft binding symbol. So these are things that we can decide that we want to do and we can make tools that write the better code, write the functioning code for us. I was originally going to make my own language and I was going to call it FOIL script, but now FOIL script is going to be a transpiler for these sorts of experiments about changing the language. And you ought to be asking yourself at this point, what about collaboration with the team? Isn't it going to be impossible for us to collaborate? And I say no, Because I'm only talking about a small subset of transformations that are inversible. They are two-way. A tool that understands what the beginning and the after and the after and the beginning is can automatically convert between these forms in the same way that we convert spaces to tabs and so forth. So I'm experimenting with this stuff. It's hard. I don't have any proof of working code yet. But I have these ideas about hacking the Git system to track this extra metadata and things. And I think it's possible. And I say, stay tuned. There's a couple of great talks on tooling, by the way, if you're interested, but super fast is my last couple of slides. I'm just going to tell you some real quick tools that you should be aware of that are already written. I'm trying to inspire you to write your own tools, and it's not that hard, but these are tools you can use. Acorn and Esprima are parsers. ES Code Gen generates the code from an AST. ES Scope and ES Levels will analyze your scopes and tell you things about scopes that you don't know. Istanbul is for code coverage. ES Traverse will analyze your AST. ESLint will go through and um, apply custom linting rules so you get to decide instead of having it be somebody else's opinion. And Plato and JS Complexity will go through and look at your code and analyze it for complexity and could possibly even fix it if you put extra code in. So what, what can we do with this? We could autocorrect misspellings in our code. Instead of waiting for the browser to find those things and waiting for bugs, we could autocorrect them. We could safely rearrange our scopes to be more efficient. We could consolidate our declarations, automatically reduce the complexity, refactor Boolean traps, optimize performance, and so much more that I haven't even listed. If we would just stop focusing on what do I have to write that looks the same as everybody else and start saying, tools are here to fix our job. And I'll leave you with this thought, where is your straw? Where has a local maximum come into play, and prevented you from being the maximum that you can be. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it.